All my crummy taste. Uh, usually unfinished things. This is not finished. I, I only finish movies. I never finish rooms or, or or apartments or houses. Only movies I finish. Yeah. Yeah, because I'll be out of this office in two years. That's the way movies are. You go from different studios and you move into an office, and just when you feel you're at home. Then you move to another studio. This is Chauncey son. Chauncey son. Hi, Chauncey. How are you doing? Five months old. Brand new. So, see, this is a camera, Chauncey. See, it's a camera. See, this is a camera. Like that? See, wave to the people. Hello. This is a magic room. Uh, kids of all ages will understand this room. Ah, the kids, that means, that means, that means, that means, that means, that video games. that means, 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 That's okay. <laughs> That's a difficult decision to make because when I commit to a movie, um, it's something I feel more than something I think about a lot. If I have to think about it a lot, it's probably the wrong movie for me. But if I feel it's right, and it's just an inner voice inside that says, "Do that movie," sometimes it nags you, you know, "Do that movie," and. 
I don't listen to it all the time, but when I do listen to it, I, I usually, you know, I'm usually happy with it, with with the decision. It's a very very difficult decision. It's it's much easier for me to commit to a movie and spend years on the movie than it is for me to commit to a kind of personal life or a personal commitment. I find that movie commitments are easier for me than personal commitments are. What kind of a decision in life which is really difficult for you to make? Getting married, having children. <laughs> the only time I'm really interested in producing is to start or give a helping hand to a new filmmaker who needs help. When I was 20 years old and Sid Scheinberg at Universal Studios saw my short film Amblin and first gave me a job, now I feel it's my responsibility to turn around and give somebody else a helping hand who might need help. Although don't send me all your scripts and please because we're already flooded out there with film projects. We can't, yeah, we We, we, it's illegal to read scripts. I can't read scripts, but I, I, I once said I will look at little movies from film students. Well, you ought to see the other office. It's just filled with movies. And I look at maybe 10 little movies a week. I'm, I'm directing one 20-minute segment from a movie called The Twilight Zone. Why don't you go ahead and come around? Yeah. He's got to look. Um, right for the first piece. Sorry. Go ahead and move around. Mr. Bloom. Shh. 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 I rest. I rest. Is this your first time in an old age home, Mr. Bloom? No, actually, Mr. Conroy. I've been in six or eight of them. Tell right, me. So I love that. Right, right into the, right into the close yeah. up from that. Tell me. Tell me, Mr. Wang. Wang. Like that. That's terrific. If you could go out there so right and play here. tonight with those children, mm -hmm. what would you want to play? Mm -hmm. Lay it on me, honey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the shot. About 20 millimeter. Uh, um, yeah, maybe you can cheat around this way a little bit oh, more. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Bend down once again. I want to get two. Yeah, better over here for two eyes, Alan. Okay. Okay. Like so. Just put the camera right in there. Okay. Let's just two eyes on Scott. There you go, man. Right here. Uh, okay. I FO would um, sort of say, uh, said that line. Uh, That last night of mine. Good uh, Lord. Is, this you your first time, is this your first time in another age home, Mr. Bullard? No, actually, Mr. Conrad. I've been in six or oh, eight of them. I'll get some hot light. And I, uh, and I got off. Tell me, uh, Mr. Dempsey. Okay, your looks are always the camera. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Chris and... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we hold Bill to there, okay? Bill, Ladies and gentlemen, around. please hold it quiet. Mr. Bloom. She is old. We are never too old to good. play. When I rest, I just cheat my rest. Uh, is this your first profile? time? No, not profile. Uh, over. Over, yeah. A little closer, a little closer Bill, to his gap. Great, right there. Okay. Is this your first time in an old age home? No, actually, Mr. Conroy, I've been in six or eight of them. Tell, oh, camera left. Yeah, yeah, camera left. Tell me, Mrs. Dempsey, if you could go out there and play with those children no, tonight. Make a little move into scat here. A little move What would you want to play? A little closer to the lens. If you could. Right here. Scat. If, you, if you could pop yeah. out of okay. that. And make it a little slower, Ben, on, on your way in. If you could pop That's out of that. All right. And play with those. Does that work for a Mrs. Dempsey? Okay, the second team. Thank you, Scott. That looks fantastic. Now, let me see No, it is. 
Entertainment tonight, and it's not. Tell them the secret we're gonna do on ET. What? The secret. Oh, this is. I told Scat. He's the black ET. Good. This is the black ET, man. Because he's getting shorter every year. He is. I grab something to me that. He said, pretend you're spinning your donut, I'll give you one upside the head. Ah. So just pretend. So that either says that you were really, really good and better than anybody else. Oh, you or you were my favorite to fresh <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, look. I love a picture. Hollywood. This has 24 pictures a second. <laughs> Or anything, it's moving. Oh, hi, Oga Sama. Hi, Oga. Good morning. Good morning. Come on in and. That's. Yes, I can't read Japanese, but they tell me that's my name in Japanese. That was a gift from Mr. Toshiro Mafuni. So why don't you step in? This is the living room, but it's also, I use this also as a projection room. Push this button, and the screen comes down, you see. So it becomes a, uh, a movie room. This is the dining room in here. Yes, I don't know if you remember this man before, but if you've ever seen him before, do you remember in, in the movie Jaws? Remember in Jaws, Richard Dreyfuss swims down and he looks in the hole of the boat and he digs the tooth out and then he looks into the hole and suddenly this pops out. Remember that? Ben Gardner, alive but dead. Right, it was one of those things where suddenly went came right out like that. <laughs> Jaws. It's very, it's very relaxing if you have time to relax. It's a nice place to. I have not had time to relax in five years, so I haven't enjoyed my own home. I much prefer shooting on location in the desert with heat and flies. Much prefer that. Well, yeah, it's an incredible life if you, if, if, if you can if you can use it if you have the time. Time is a luxury. So 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 material possessions are really insignificant. A, a, a man who has time to, to spend on his family and on himself is a very rich man. So I do not consider myself a very rich man. I'm too busy doing this. Spend more time by myself. I'm more comfortable with myself, and uh, I'm around people so much in my life, yeah. in my work, that there's very little time for me to 
meditate. So I'm hoping in the future to have more time for meditation, which I think will help my movie making. Do you basically think you'll be able to keep up the pace that you're going now, though? Oh, yeah, but, you know, the older you get, this, you start to slow down. I mean, I'm 34, I'll be 35 in December, middle middle of December, so uh, I think I got a few, a few more good years left in me. But if Mr. Kurosawa can be so vital and so talented and so energetic about his movie making and his movie magic, at his age, he's in the 70s, I could only hope that bodes well for my generation. If we can take a lesson from Mr. Kurosawa, and if my generation can make movies into our 70s and 80s, that's a happy thought for the future. It's something It's something to look forward to. Hello? Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So, what do you want? Help. Yeah, let's I can't. Some yeah, please. Because I. Is work, was working with Steven Spielberg keep you very, very busy? Very busy. Constantly busy. But it's real fun. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Long days, but a lot of fun. Are there a lot of people that buy for his attention? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And why can I be? Ta <laughs> Who should I talk to? This person here. <laughs> what what area of working with Steve do you find you pay the most attention to? Uh, the details of his private life mostly, and keeping that straight for him. Such as <laughs> appointments, dinner schedules, his daily schedules mostly, making sure he gets in here and gets his appointments taken care of, getting his phone calls done, and feeling fielding all the mail. And there's a lot of that. Um, one of the things that the director and the producer noticed about your very easy relationship with Steve was the fact that you seem like you were almost like an old married couple that had been together for 10 years. No. Oh, God. Well, no, I... <laughs> well, we haven't been, but I, I, I tend to just make myself comfortable, and then if, if he didn't like it, he would throw me out or something, I guess. So it's, it's easier to just try and, you know be relaxed about it because it's so harried and so stressed a lot of the times so that it's much easier to just be comfortable about it, unlike this situation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kathy. Okay. Thanks. Bye. They, they found me. They, they tracked me out. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. What is it? This is. I'm, what, I'm, you're eating American meat, and I'm eating Japanese food. Well, where'd you get them? Japanese food? Do you have any real sushi? Nippon sushi. Oh, you have this yeah. one. I don't like it. Anago, or unagi, and uni. Yeah. Sea urchin. I know. That's the kind of. You don't like that. You don't have any maguro left. Uh, no maguro. We no. have, um, no maguro. We just have, uh, no, eel. Eel. Where's the eel? Is that eel? Yeah. That's eel. Is that cooked eel? I hope so. Let's see. What is? Arnold Schwarzenegger eats this stuff. So that's. He does? Yeah. That's yeah. good. You like that? That's eel. John loves Japanese food. So. Mm. Oh, it's good. Yeah. Good eel. You both look into the camera and say, mm, eel, mm. oishi. Oishi. Eel. <laughs> eel. Yes. Eel. You're supposed to say eel. <laughs> oh, look at this. Look what's coming. Okay. Wow. Which one is it? 
Which one do you want? Well, better give John the one with one. the. Okay, you that's the small one. one. Yeah. So you get. I got. I got the one with the most whipped cream. Yeah. Okay. I want the small. I'm fat. You want a piece of pumpkin pie? Anybody else want your pumpkin pie? Pumpkin pie, you're right there. Right there. Make sure I want pumpkin pie. Would you like some of this whipped cream? Here, Michelle. I was hoping somebody would help me. Catch, Michelle. <laughs> I was, I'm so guilty. In the rest of Hollywood, people get very involved with drugs. We get very involved in food. That's right. We actually get high on this stuff. <laughs> Many people in Hollywood love, love cocaine. Yeah. But. With us, it's whipped cream. Whipped cream. <laughs> For us. We love whipped cream. No snow, Thank whipped you. cream. Thank you. <laughs> How often do you come here in a talk like this? Oh, once or twice a week. Yeah. Once or twice yeah. a week? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. When there's nothing to do over at my office. What do you talk about? Uh, oh, girls. Girls. <laughs> mostly girls. <laughs> girls first. <laughs> then, uh... We talk about girls, and we talk about, uh... Scandal. Scandal. Scandal is a good tough <laughs> subject for conversation. Girls and scandal. You know, there's always a good scandal going on. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the difference between when I go back to school and I see the younger kids now, especially at SC, is they expect something. They really expect, they, they're, they're very aware of young filmmakers and what it is to be you know, a young film, and some of them are just terrific. They're technically much better than we ever were. That it's, it's just extraordinary what they will be technically by the time they're in their 30s or whatever. But they don't have the same passion. Now, you see, the, the, the new generation of filmmakers I call the microchip generation. <laughs> the microchip generation. And, and, uh, uh, and yet they have forgotten their literary roots. Our generation almost forgot our literary roots, but we were able to really love the old movies, and in analyzing the old movies, we realized it was much more story and writing th than technique or directorial influence. It was much more the ideas the films were made of that made them interesting to us. And then everything on top of that was icing on the cake, because John Huston directed it. It was a much better movie than had somebody else lesser than John Huston. And yet um, Stephen has a boundless energy, and... An absolute innocence. Uh, there's, a, there's no matter what happens to Stephen, he looks at the world as if he's seen it for the first time. And I think that's why people love his films so much, because he brings them back, no matter what he makes a film about, he brings them back to when they were seeing things for the first time. And so it doesn't even matter if Stephen made a war film, a bitter, dark war film, it would have an innocence about it. I mean, it's not that it's, you know, look at E.T., and it's not... There are movies like E.T., there have been movies like E.T., but there's the, it's that innocence in that movie. In Poltergeist, which is a scary ghost story, you, you feel there's a, you're on a ride, you, you're going with it, it's, uh, you're seeing it for the first time. And, and I think that's his strongest thing, more than any technical ability or anything else, is that, that somehow, and really good filmmakers of my generation, of any other generation, always have some strange quirk that you know, marks their work, and, and that's what his is, is that, that innocence, I think. I like that. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, a, that's a wistful, isn't it? Yeah. That's kind of sweet. Yeah, either, either this or this. But this, this one doesn't show how his head is, you know? Yeah, this, this one's more alien-like, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and the fact of the, where it is on the pit. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's the one. Okay, great, thanks. Any fear, he's... Way down the door. Hey, Bob! What are you doing here? Well, John. <laughs> oh, you have to roll on Bob here. You have to roll on Bob because this is getting close to critical mass. Yes, yes. yes. yes it's almost there. If Bob Gale comes in, this whole office melts down in yeah. 10 seconds. That's right. The, the, the whole thing, people have said to never get four of us together in a room at one time because we exceed critical mass. Yes. This is Bob Zemeckis who made... Um, Movies that you've seen in Japan, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and Used Karza, or whatever you would call it. <laughs> used the Karza. <laughs> used yes, the Karza. Yes. Now, the term that I use are uh, mentor. You guys mentor. are my mentors. mentors. This guy helped me in my, to give me my uh, break as a writer, and this guy my break as a director. 
which is uh, why I'm in the middle. Bob and Bob, the, the two brothers, Bob, wrote a terrific script, and and the, and the script was about the Japanese attacking Southern California, uh, December thirteenth, nineteen forty-two, forty-one. This triumvirate here is a, a good blend of uh, of sort of um, uh, ideas and um, feelings about different things, and it was like uh, it was always interesting to be in the same room with these two guys because everything would end up being a very good balance between ideas and feelings about a lot of stuff. And uh, of course, the important thing is that we all just make movies that we love, and you know, movies that are true movies I wish I wish I could say yes I wish there were more because if there were more I'd certainly know about it and I'd, I'd want to be of some help but unfortunately there are very few there are many new filmmakers but there are very few good new filmmakers and that seems to be the problem we're not recycling as quickly as Hollywood used to in, in, the, in the days in the old days of the one reelers and the serials and and the old uh, you know Saturday matinee movies the important thing was was to be able to there are so few movies that are made um, and every year they get less and less and what Stephen did that was the most important thing for me is because movies are so expensive today and so few are made that it's very difficult for a studio to um, a studio head to give a young filmmaker a, a, a break because there's so much risk involved. Right, a lot of risk. And uh, when, you know, an established and, and brilliant filmmaker like Steven can say, I think this guy has got talent and, you know, he has got my support, um, then they would be willing to, you know, take the risk on you because they would feel more comfortable about that. And that is the most important thing. Well, no, we didn't. We didn't really. Uh, what we did was George. Uh, George gave a gift of almost five million dollars to USC to build a studio, a fourteen million dollar studio, within the ca campus. Oh. Now, that was a few years ago, and then we got a phone call after uh, I think Empire Strike uh, Strikes Back was released and George said, uh, come up and see me, I think I'm ready. And he said, now, I uh, got to be a mogul sooner than I, I thought, uh, no, but he said, uh, I think now I can help. And it was through his initial impetus gift and his uh, you, know, you know, real help in soliciting other filmmakers who were uh, successful, alums and non-alums, uh, that got the ball rolling in terms of the fundraising. And so that's really how it all began. And because Spielberg and Lucas are such a good friends and colleagues, I think uh, George, uh, I don't know what happened, probably called up Stephen and says, can you help? And uh, from that, this uh, is now. But together, we, uh, along with several others, have been supporting the raising of the uh, remaining monies to build this fantastic studio within a college. And uh, I'm happy to announce that two weeks ago, uh, because of a very nice, generous gift from Warner Brothers or Warner Communication and Steve Ross, uh, we met our $14 million goal, and we have every cent to finish the uh, studio before the uh, 
not finish it, but to have it well in the way before the 1984 Olympics begin. So it's, that's real happy to, you know. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Oh my goodness, here's Stevo. At about two to three months. When I see how docile his face is, I just knew that expression meant something ingenious was coming, like Mr. Innocence with the eyes, and then watch it. And then <laughs> then watch it. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, all right. Steve wanted a fire engine so badly. Not like other children want something. I mean, watch it. He like, mm. So we finally bought him this fire engine, which was expensive. Steve would not let anybody come near it, even to touch it. If a child from the neighborhood came out and put their hand on it, the kid removed a bloody stump. But we did whatever, he, he directed us. He really did. From and we, a very young age? Always. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, this is firelight.
Very often. I see Steve often. I we still have you know, a wonderful relationship. I'm still mom. Mom. And I get a the phone call comes through of mom, will you come over and make some chicken soup with matzo oh. balls? And I run and I go and I buy the chickens and we have um, Steve comes in to eat. Emega mega foot in us. Say no. What was it? Cutting us. Five. Three tons of them. He's circling the boat for his height. Hurry it up now, tie it on. Hurry it up, he's coming straight for us. Don't screw it up now. Don't wait for me. Now! Shoot! Make him fast! The king's trying to run! I said, oh, it's great. We have the, the Japanese television stations here. That's right. They're here at Fuji, and as we speak, the camera's rolling, recording everything I'm saying on this end. <laughs> so I won't say anything to leave. Well, the first time I met Steven Spielberg, uh, Steven was, I guess, 20 years old. And uh, the thing I remember most vividly is he kept calling me Mr. Scheinberg. Mm -hmm. And... I had just seen uh, this film, Amblin, and I guess the thing that I remember most from this meeting was that he was very anxious, uh, in a nearly childlike way, to direct a picture before he was 21. And I told him that I was confident that uh, he would be able to do so. And uh, I am pleased that I was able to deliver on that assurance. Well. I was very taken uh, with uh, Stevens' work uh, when I saw Amblin. Uh, you know, most uh, young uh, filmmakers, at least in the days when I was looking at young filmmakers' work, which unfortunately I don't do these days, uh, most young filmmakers tend to undertake very glitzy, uh, showy material, and they often run away from simplicity and uh, sentiment. And I was very taken with the humanity behind Amblin. And uh, needless to say, it also demonstrated uh, a great professionalism. So I, from the very beginning, thought that Stephen uh, had a 
great opportunity. Uh, he would be a very important filmmaker. I am convinced that uh, anything that Stephen set out to do, uh, he would do very, very well. Uh, and if it had to do with uh, uh, running a company or something in the business world as distinguished from the creative world, he would do it well. Because he's one of those people that learns what he has to learn, listens very carefully, absorbs it, and uh, very soon thereafter uh, becomes a master of it. So I think that Stephen, as a successful uh, producer uh, and or director, uh, is uh, nothing, uh, nothing surprises me. Because uh, I think anything he set out to do, he would do just wonderfully. Japanese, and this is a good way to do it. Oh, that's fantastic. Let me see how I can, which way to sit up. That's great. No. I'm, a, I'm a good audience. Sometimes I do a scene, and I, I forget that I directed the scene and wrote the scene, and like an audience, I'm going, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so, and, 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 and the best scenes I do are the scenes that I really forgot what I did to make those scenes work, because I re, I'm reacting like the audience. And, 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 and that's entertainment more than, more than um, the, the forcing of entertainment or the forcing of, uh, of characters and story. It's, forcing is a very bad word in film. I think it's important in a story, in a movie story, the audience should, should know what's going to happen next. Not specifically, but should have some idea what's going to happen next. The audience should be a little bit ahead of the movie. Not, not a great deal ahead, but just Scotia. <laughs> it gives the audience a power and control and a satisfaction that, that they are almost helping to tell the story through their own imaginations. Uh 
観客は自分のそのねあのいわゆるイマジネーションでその映画をいかにも自分がその語ってるようなそのなんていうかしらコントロールしてるようなそういった感情満足感っていうものができるわけ。それがねその観客を喜ばせるその秘訣になってるね。So for me a movie is a partnership between the director or the storyteller and the audience。ですから彼にとって映画っていうものは監督あるいはまずはそのストーリーテラーと観客で出来上がるものだ。パートナーで出来上がっていくのが映画っていう。ああなるほどね。なるほど。でも、ウェアクターズで。Well, I, I, I think I direct children by, by, by making them not act。うん。つまりアクトさせないこと、演技させないこと。By forcing them away from play acting or pretend acting and, and trying to get to who they are as people in their own lives。だからそのね、誰かの演技をしてるんじゃなくて、彼ら自身をその人にさせちゃうわけ。例えば、そういうふうな演技の指導をするわけ。芝居じゃないわけ。その子供にしちゃうわけ。And that's just, I just did that very simply by, by, by being their buddies, by being their pals.、Mm-hmm. You know? それはね、やっぱりその子たちと仲良くするのが一番だ。And not really,、uh, not really、uh, forcing them to do anything they wouldn't do in their real, in their natural life. で、普通しないようなことを押し付けてやってたら絶対しないわけ。I made them feel very free to add, add comments, add dialogue if they felt like saying something that wasn't in the script. Just go ahead and say it. Don't be intimidated by the cameras and by what you're paid to say. Forget that. Just sometimes, yes, yes, do the scene as written, but then add things.、Uh, uh, what would, I would always turn to the kids and I would say, What would you say in this situation? What would you do in this situation? <laughs> お前なら何て言うか、かこっちの現場で聞くが多いお前なら何て言うそれでもそのまま使っていっちゃう。So the children all felt like they were making a real contribution. だからその子供たちも自分が映画作ってそれすごいね、いい気持ちになりますよね。They were leasing themselves to me for the, the, the time it took to make the movie. だから本当にもうね、彼を発散してるわけ子供たちこの映画作りってことで自分で痛いこと言ったらやりたいことやってて。But it also, I took, I took eight months to find those kids. Those kids are very special. Well, there's, there's no time for quality in television. And the producers of television have very little respect for the viewers at home. であのつまりテレビのプロデューサーはいわゆる家庭で見ている人に対して尊敬の念がないっていう。This is in America. さあまあじゃあアメリカの話ですよ。I don't know Japanese television. This is just America. <笑> And because of that, the television producers in America talk down to their audiences. でねだからそのアメリカのプロデューサーはどうしてもなんていうの目下に見てものを言う。上から下にものを言う。見下してるという。And with the exception of very few shows. They insult the intelligence of audiences. で、まあ、本当はまあ例外は少しありますけども、一応た、大抵の番組はですね、見てる観客の姿勢をね、バカにしたものが多い。But because that's all that's on television, and TV is all the same, it pulls the intellect of the viewer down into the trenches. で、本当にもうそのテレビというものはね、その見てる人のその姿勢を頭から剥ぎ取ってですね、溝の中に突っ込んでるのはそういったもの。So rather than raising consciousness, It devours consciousness.、Um, although I, I think that certain shows this year are very, very good. There's a very good hospital show in, in, on television here called Saint Elsewhere, which I just saw. It's fantastic. And Hill Street Blues. And Hill Street Blues is good. Taxi is good. A new series this year called Cheers is very funny. MASH has some very good things on it. But all these soap operas are just.、Uh... Lunch. Great. Have you seen ET? Oh, yeah. Oh, God.
you know, the movie is for everybody. It's for little kids, it's for old, old people. But it's, it, it really was, I, I made it for people who still believe inside that they are young, that they can still remember what it was like to, uh, you know, to uh, have a friend in the world that maybe is a magical friend. I could be when I was 10 years old. I wish I could be as good as him at 10. I was not as good as Elliot or as smart as Elliot 10. I wish I could have been. The, the childlikeness. It is Steve. It is Steve. Yes. E.T. is, I think, uh, Stephen's greatest work. Uh, it's the movie that uh, uh, Stephen was born to do. And uh, everything about Stephen. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. I brought you a little present. This is the very serious writer of E.T., a uh, very serious person. You may here. have wondered why E.T. looked like he did. <laughs> That's what I look like. You know how artists often paint themselves like Van Gogh, self-portraits? This is a self-portrait of E.T. Look at this. This is this, these nursery school oh kids. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Look Who did this? Great nursery school kids. Oh, look at this. They're all E.T. Nursery school kids all did all these of ET. <laughs> e so what, what? ET on a bike? Yes, you can. <laughs> no, put it on! <laughs> I think just the, um, the simple understanding that these two little creatures, a little earth boy and a little alien, could understand each other with, with, no, with nothing in common. That if they could understand each other, anybody could understand each other. I think that was probably it. Well, I remember, like, I came into Stephen one day and said, we got to get E.T. out on the street, right? He said, yeah. I said, now, there's only one night of the year he can go out on the street, right? Halloween. So I was afraid that that was too, that, that was too um, easy an idea, but it worked out all right. It turned out to be. Then the whole movie got sort of built around Halloween. We were, we were constant collaborators. It was, I'd have an idea, he'd have an idea. I'd have a bad idea, he'd have a bad idea. We'd come into a good idea, so... It was 50-50, um, let's say. <laughs> I think it's def it definitely would have been different if a man wrote it. I think that that my relationship with children helped a lot. I have lots of children friends, and lots of kids are over at our house a lot, and I listen to the way they talk a lot. And I think my relationship with kids helped, and I think that, that probably a man would have a different relationship than that. So it's hard to say, but I probably. Stephen was the man in the movie. <laughs> now that he's gone, I'll tell you what he's really like now. <laughs> what is he really like? <laughs> Stephen is a, is a wonderful person. He's lots of fun, he's brilliant, he's hardworking, he's curious and helpful and serious and silly. He's 
a, he's a good friend. I'm keeping him. My input was to find locations and design sets that would take the kind of suburban look that he wanted and turn it into something a little bit magical. And I think we were successful. How do you feel about Steven Spielberg? For example, when you're working with him, was he really severe, very relaxed, a dictator, a very passive observer, free reign? Yes. <laughs> All of the above. But mostly, I found the experience quite exciting, and I enjoyed it tremendously. Could you elaborate on working with him? Um, it's very stimulating. He would, uh, he grasps ideas very, very quickly and elaborates on them very quickly, uh, so that a lot of your time is not spent explaining your ideas, but instead talking creative ideas, which is exciting. One of the others that, that uh, presents a challenge but gives you an opportunity that nothing else will do is working with smoke because we used smoke or, or mist in many of the scenes, inside as well as outside. Of course, all of the night exteriors, the scenes in the forest, it begins that way. When you work with mist or smoke, particularly exterior, you have very, very difficult problems of controlling it. How is Stephen different today than he was then? And I'd say that, of course, he has to be different. Mainly, we, one of the jokes that uh, goes on on Stephen's sets is that he has to wear so many hats that one moment he has to be the producer of, uh, you know, the executive producer of his next uh, how many films, and then uh, at other moments he, he has to be worrying about the finances. But when he turns his attention to making film, he's still the same person he was when he was 19. He's still the same filmmaker, and you, you can address his interests in the same way. And his, his concentration and his desire to have only the best are, uh, remains unchanged in all these years. What kind of a person? Oh, what kind of a person? Stevens, Stevens, a big kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steven's probably one of the most optimistic people I've ever been around. He, he sees the good side of everything. I think we wanted, mostly, we, we were excited about the fact after the movie had come out that we achieved um, our intention of making a film that expressed love and friendship and understanding, but was also what most people thought was a children's movie. We always felt appealed to all ages. And uh, when the movie came out, that was proved to us.
forget that day, I'll tell you. I went home high as a kite. I always hate to demonstrate these things on the piano to anybody but you because... It was nice because I could right away hear that was violins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you uh, create music for film, uh, does he make a, a, a suggestion of ideas, specific suggestions he has on music you're going to create? He has always a lot of good ideas. Yeah. I usually start. Are you taking you? Oh, yeah, because you can ask us questions from there. Yeah, and sorry, it's, a it's very of, casual. Oh, it's, yeah. oh, it's very it's casual. kind of like dropping on the Joneses for, for, oh, for, for brunch. <laughs> yeah. we, well, I, I usually play these themes for him, you know, on the piano. And uh, he has very good reaction, a very good, a very good sense of what's musically right. And he helps me a lot, too. A lot of times I think I, when I... Uh, uh, you know this thing I was just playing. E.T. It used to finish. That was the end of the music, and Stephen said it needs another phrase, other kind of section, and that's what this thing. So maybe something like that. Yeah. He says, "Yeah, yeah, go ahead. With that. <laughs> you know, keep it going." That kind of thing that he does, you know, with me. Oh, that was. Yeah, I remember very well. It was uh, before I went out to make the movie The Sugarland Express. I had heard two of John's scores on Mark Rydell movies, one from The Cowboys with John Wayne and the other before that, several years before, called The Reavers with Steve McQueen. And I was nuts about the music. It was, I'm, I'm a soundtrack collector and I've collected the scores of great composers uh, from the first pressings, the first time scores got into record stores, which was in the early 50s. I had a huge collection and for many years, there was like a, a drought. Uh, a, a lot of the great old composers like Dmitry Tiomkin and Max Steiner were no longer writing music anymore. Uh, Demi was losing his sight, and I think Max died in, in the early 60s. And uh, there was just a real loss of, uh, of pure symphonic film music. And then when I heard the Reavers and the Cowboys, I said, my God, this guy must be 80 years old. <laughs> I really thought, really? Here's some, I thought maybe here's some guy who's 80 years old who maybe wrote his greatest scores of his life. And I went and found who this guy was, and I met this young man named John Williams, and I was amazed. I said, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, it's a rebirth. <laughs> film music is back. It's alive. Hallelujah. And I was only 75. <laughs> <laughs> For, and in my experience, I, I think he's very special as a filmmaker and also as a person as an interesting person why he's such an interesting filmmaker i think and uh tremendous insight into into what makes an entertaining film and tremendously musical if you don't mind my saying it stephen musical in the sense of rhythm i think stephen has a wonderful sense of rhythm in his films and as a musician it's something that i appreciate every film ha the action has a kind of tempo or rhythm in it or it doesn't have it you know and i look at the film i'm trying to find out just exactly how fast is it or how slow is it because the film is telling me what the tempo is and with steven's film i find it all very rhythmical and easy in a, in a funny way of saying it easier to score easier for me to make music for than a lot of other people's films because the films themselves have a a singing musical quality i I mean, particularly a thing like E.T., fabulous for music, because it, the, the picture has phrases almost, you know? That's because I make my it's, movies with Johnny in mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, but it's true, the bicycle goes, it's, you know, so it's perfect for music, it's, you know? And I think, I think Stephen is very... And I, I, in every kind of art, in the theater, in opera, musical, comedy, all around, the best directors for me are, pe are people who are also musical. I think it's part of the art of, of, of what they do. Uh, you remember the Jaws thing? You know, though? I can tell you, with the first day with Steven said, what are you going to play for Jaws? I went... <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're crazy. It's a serious movie. I thought he was going to say, no, no, I'm only kidding, and here's... And he was about to play this very poetic pastoral symphony. And John said, no, 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 it's, you, you've made a very primal movie. You know, your movie's about the dinosaurs, the, the, you know, the, the ancient world, the land of the giants. It's not about, uh, it's, it's not poetic, it's not art. It's artful. 
and he played the bass, the, those basser sounds, which I love. You know, that, that is Jaws. That's the voice of Jaws. Oh my God! I you asked the hardest questions. I don't <laughs> believe it. I don't think I could do that without thinking about it. But it would be a nice idea to write him a piece, you know? No, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I don't want a piece. I will express myself and, and, and through music, through on this piano, as I know myself. Okay? Which is very simply like this. <laughs> With occasionally this. And that's how I feel about myself. That's it. Play a little bit of that piece, maybe. Do you mean this? Uh, I think of flying. This melody is always getting higher. Uh, and then the middle section. I want to go do it a little bit over to the second. He's conducting. That's when the bicycle takes off. <laughs> it's it's easy to be inspired by such a thing with so much lift, you know, and love in it. I, it's a very inspiring film. And, and, and when the other bicycle takes off, you know, the movie goes into the never applaud. Applaud. Maybe it's this chord. <laughs> Forever, ever. Forever. Thank you.